The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is scripted by Newell Fisher and Dalibar. It is recorded, edited and narrated by Newell Fisher and the showcase image is by Nina Pokorowski. Many thanks to Wikipedia and the Internet Movie Database for their assistance with researching this episode. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 122, in which we'll be introducing the 1999-2001 to television series of Watership Down. First though, a bit of burrow keeping. Can I remind you again about our appeal to raise funds for the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund via JustGiving.com, the link to which will be in the notes, or just search JustGiving.com under my name, Newell Fisher. Incidentally, this week is Rabbit Awareness Week in the UK. There will be a link to this in the notes. Next, last week I read out a very touching comment from Jen in Oregon during which she mentioned an audiobook of Watership Down narrated by Richard Adams, which I was excited to hear about. Well, I've had a correction from her this week as follows, quote, I did some research, and it appears that what we heard was this beautifully narrated version, which was not narrated by Richard Adams. He read the prologue from Richard Adams in the first person, and I must have not heard and or my son talked over the bit where the narrator introduced himself, or was introduced by Blackstone Audio, end quote. Thank you for the correction, Jen. It would have been wonderful to have such an audiobook version of the book, but sadly it was not to be. Next, this week's showcase image is a screen print portraying the Black Rabbit of Inlay by Owsler member Nina Pokowski, who is Illumination on Instagram. Link in the notes. Next, a few afterthoughts on last week's interview, having had time to reflect on it. When you do a podcast on your own, you have to get very fond of the sound of your own voice. Seriously, I check back over past episodes all the time. You just have to, to keep up with all the stuff you've said in the past. And then, when you find yourself talking to someone else, you suddenly have to switch that off a bit. Especially when you're a middle-aged man with a slight lack of awareness of social cues, talking to a highly educated and much younger woman. I really hope I got the conversational balance right last week, but wouldn't be at all surprised if I didn't. Listening back, I'm also amused at the way I assumed that Catherine would know about studies happening in other areas of film studies, when it is a vast field. Her comments on fan studies were also fascinating and took me back to the early days of this podcast when I started to become aware of the huge Warship Down fandom that I'd only had a limited awareness of before. I look forward to any academic studies on this that seem relevant to what we're doing here. Next, Dalibar on the YouTube comments had this to say, quote, Lovely interview and insight into what brought about the book and about others still doing academic analysis on the world of Warship Down. I watched the movie before reading the book and probably picked it up at a library or blockbuster back when those existed. I was probably six or so when I saw it in the early 2000s. Funny, now that I think about it, I don't think I gave much mind to the blood and violence in the movie directly. I just thought it was a fantastic movie and liked that it felt more mature and thought the more graphic scenes were impactful, but I don't recall feeling scared or traumatised by it. It really is interesting that Bright Eyes only plays upon Hazel's potential premature death, the loss of his potential desires and goals for not only himself but his warren being cut short, the light that burns so brightly suddenly going pale before its time. Whereas his death after a life fully lived is bittersweet but not snuffed out before its time. It burned to its fullest and brightest, so while sad it can be a life celebrated in death. And as for animation, I do miss the old-fashioned hand-drawn style, flaws and all, but it is great technology. It has allowed the bar for entry to animation to lower considerably. There is an adult-aimed animation group that makes two really well-done shows called Hell of a Boss and Has Been Hotel, which have gotten very popular. It's cool to see not only adult-centred cartoons, but once started by smaller groups. A lot of cartoons, while aimed at children, have a large adult fan following. Shows like Steven Universe are ageless and helped me a lot when I was depressed with how inclusive the world is. Plus, there is anime which has a lot of very heavy subject matter and aimed towards a mature audience, like Monster, which I highly recommend. Thank you both for the great talk. End quote. Thank you for those comments, Dalibar. I think your analysis of why Bright Eyes wasn't used at the end of the film is spot on. Incidentally, I forgot to mention that if you want to follow Catherine Esther on Twitter, she posts as Watership Down Research. Her handle is at Watership Down 40. I'll add this to the notes for last week. Anyway, time to watch some television. Introduction to the 1999-2001 TV series.
The 1999 to 2001 television series of Watership Down was the second animated portrayal of the book after the 1978 film. It was a joint UK-Canadian production made in association with Nepenthe Productions, the production company of Martin Rosen, producer and director of the 1978 film, who still held the film rights to the story. The UK production company was All Time Entertainment and the Canadian one Decode Entertainment, though there was additional funding from the Canadian government and the provincial government of Ontario. There were three seasons, each of 13 episodes. The first two aired in the UK on the CITV channel, an offshoot of the independent television channel that became the first UK competitor to the BBC in 1955. In Canada, all three seasons aired on YTV, an English-language youth-targeted channel founded in 1988 and owned by Chorus Entertainment. It was a sister channel of Nickelodeon. Season 1 aired in the UK from September to December 1999. Season 2 aired in the UK from August to October 2000. Season 3 aired in Canada from September to December 2001. It only aired in Europe in Germany and Greece. By sheer morbid coincidence, the first episode of season three aired on 9-11. The musical score for the series was written by Mike Batt, the composer of Bright Eyes, and the orchestral portions were performed by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Stephen Gately, Keris Matthews, Mike Carrick and no less than Art Garfunkel himself also performed songs for the series. The score received a Gemini Award in Canada in 2003. As far as analysing the TV series goes, as an editorial decision, I will be dealing with one episode of the series in each episode of the podcast. When I analysed the 1978 film, I looked at a maximum of five minutes of the film in each episode. This was a deliberate decision to look at the film in that much detail. The episodes of the TV series are 23 minutes long. This means that I will be analysing it in roughly four to five times less detail than I did the film, and this will remain my approach for now unless I see a genuine reason to change this. My provisional conclusion is that this is the right approach to take, given the volume of material I'm dealing with and the cultural legacy of that material. As ever, any and all opinions on this are welcome in the honeycomb via the usual channels. The voice cast of the TV series. The first two seasons of the TV series of Watership Down featured a wide range of impressive talent in its cast, though many of these were replaced in season three. The following list is for the first two seasons only, and I will repeat the approach I took when introducing the cast of the 1978 film by trying to give examples of where the international listenership of this podcast will probably best be able to spot them. As I said then, this will not therefore necessarily represent their best work, just that which will be easiest to find for the listenership of this podcast. Hazel was played by Ian Shaw, son of Robert Shaw, who played Quint in Jaws, 1975, and Mary Mary Ewer, who played Mary Ellison in Where Eagles Dare, 1968. He is probably best spotted in TV drama Sharp's Gold, 1995, as Lieutenant Ayres. For me, his voice as Hazel carries an authority that easily rivals that of John Hurt in the 1978 film. Fiverr was played by Andrew Falvey, who appeared in the British TV series Johnny and the Dead, 1995, based on a novel by Terry Pratchett. Bigwig was played by comedian and actor Stephen Mangan, probably best spotted as motorsports manager Alastair Caldwell in the Formula One film Rush, 2013. Mangan's voice as Bigwig, unfortunately, helped to cement the image of Bigwig the the buffoon, though he did redeem himself a little in series three. Blackberry was played in the first gender-swapped role in Portrayals of Watership Down by Sue Elliott Nichols, who played a shoe shop manageress in the film Babs, 2017. Dandelion was played by British comedian Phil Jupitus, probably best spotted in the 2001 British mockumentary Mike Bassett, England Manager, as Tomo Thompson. His voice for Dandelion is one I find a bit irritating, which is a shame for a storyteller. Hawkbit, who was the chosen outskirt of the series and basically took the place of Silver in the 1978 film as the resident cynic, was played by Lee Ross. He can be spotted playing Danny Argyropoulos in Rogue Trader, 1999. His voice is appropriately curmudgeonly, far more so than Silver's in 1978. Pipkin was played by Elliot Henderson Boyle, who played the young Lancelot in King Arthur, 2004. In this series, Pipkin is basically portrayed as a child with a voice to match, rather than Roy Kinnear's small adult in 1978. Kihar the Seagull was played by British comedy legend Rick Mayle. 
whose tragic death in 2014 was a source of serious celebrity mourning for me. For an international audience, he is probably best spotted as Drop Dead Fred 1991 in the title role, though for me he will always be Rick in the landmark British comedy ser TV series from the 80s, The Young Ones, as well as Richard Richard in the 90s TV classic Bottom. And then, of course, there is Lord Flashheart in series 2 and 4 of Blackadder, possibly his most visible international TV work. His key heart is probably exactly as annoying as he would have intended, with a vaguely Eastern European accent that he enjoys exaggerating as much as possible. Outrageous performances were always his speciality. Hannah the Mouse, the main character invented for this, t this series, and probably inspired by the mouse who helps the rabbits of Watership Down in the original novel, is played by the highly versatile and talented actor Jane Horrocks. She was Bubbles in the British TV comedy series Absolutely Fabulous, 1992-2012, and played the title role in the film Little Voice, 1998. I shouldn't need to say any more. Primrose, who is basically Heisenthlay, is played by Kate Ashfield. She was Simon Pegg's estranged girlfriend in Shaun of the Dead, 2004. Cowslip is played, all too briefly, by British comedy and acting legend Stephen Fry. I was very tempted to not even bother giving an example of his work. However, if you insist, he was Gordon Dietrich in V for Vendetta, 2005. The minor character of Hickory, chief rabbit of Redstone Warren, was played by none other than Kiefer Sutherland, who didn't bother with a British accent. The Lost Boys, 1987, if you need an example of his work. Blackavar, another minor character in the series, is played by the much-missed Stephen Gately, originally of Boyzone. He also covered the song Bright Eyes for the series very capably. Finally, we come to the two cast members of the 1978 film who appeared in this series. Richard Briars, who played Fiverr in 1978 and died in 2013, plays Captain Broom, former captain of the Redstone Owsler. And John Hurt, who played Hazel in 1978 and died in 2017, plays, wait for it, General Woundwart. Yes, you heard me right. John Hurt's voice later in his career became ideal for villainous roles. He was the Supreme Chancellor in Adam Suttler in V for Vendetta 2005, and his casting as Hazel's nemesis in the TV series is delicious irony. I have missed out many members of the cast focusing on the main characters and notable actors who played minor roles, but I hope to fill in the gaps as we go along. The main characters on the screen. So, what are these familiar characters like in this series? How do they look? I regret not doing this at the start of the 1978 film, but the following should make up for that a little. I'll focus on the initial residents of Warship Down for now. Starting with Hazel and Fiverr, who else? Both brothers are mostly mid-brown with cream-coloured chests, but with darker brown colouring on their heads, in a similar pattern to Blackberry in the 1978 film, covering the whole of both ears and the top of the head and nose. His colouring in that film was an extension of the mere black-tipped ears he has in the novel. Generally in this series, the chest of the rabbit seems to be lighter in contrast with the body than in the 1978 film. Bigwig's appearance is a radical departure from his first portrayal on film. He is grey, rather than his previous brown, with a very light grey front, but his wig is now more of a mane, completely surrounding his head and extending down his chest. In series 1 and 2, this mane was darker than the rest of him. In series 3, it was made lighter for some reason. Blackberry, as mentioned before, is now a light grey doe with a white chest, with no physical resemblance to either the novel description or film portrayal of the male Blackberry. Dandelion, Rather than being the rather nondescript rabbit he was in the 1978 film, though slightly darker than Hazel and Fiverr, is now a light brown and very lanky rabbit with long, thin, black-tipped ears. Hawkbit, who had not been portrayed on film before, is small and quite thick-set with dark grey fur and a light grey chest. The childlike Pipkin is a grey-brown with the same build as in the 1978 film and big round eyes. Kiha the seagull is bigger than in the 1978 film, with an even more albatross-like beak that moves even further away from the actual appearance of black-headed gulls. As in the film, he retains his darker head throughout, though in reality this species has a mostly white head in the summer. Hannah the mouse is the only main character completely invented for this series, among, among the first residents of Watership Down, and is, well, a mouse. She is mid-brown with a cream-coloured chest, this lighter colour extending around her mouth. Her most distinctive feature is this large three-lobed bite that has been taken out of her right ear at some point. 
So there we are. The initial characters of the 1999 TV series are introduced. But how does it look overall? The style of the series. In last week's interview with Catherine Lester, we mentioned a continuum of animation styles that was written about by Maureen Furness about 20 years ago. Though I've yet to read up on the detail of this, the underlying idea is pretty easy to grasp. The 1978 film of Watership Down tried broadly to portray the physical universe we occupy with the same laws of physics and proportions. The only major departure from this being physically accurate rabbits, though with a range of facial expressions and, of course, the ability to speak. With the 1999-2001 to 2001 TV series, we move very firmly away from this to a more abstract portrayal of reality that looks right from the start like what it is, an animation made for children. Far more liberties are taken with both the physicality of the characters and the landscape around them, as well as the laws of physics. In fact, you could even accuse the series of Disneyfication, as the landscape of Chalk Downland is transformed into a far more dramatic one that includes rivers and caves. These are just some of the crimes against Watership Down that I mentioned in episode 14 on originalism and revisionism, and they remind me of the dramatisation of landscape that occurred in some of, the, of Disney's Winnie the Pooh films that were set in the Ashdown Forest in the Sussex Weald, close to where I live. However, the Ashdown Forest does actually have streams and rocky outcrops, unlike Chalk Downland, being based on sandstone rather than chalk, so the exaggeration of landscape is not so gratuitous in Winnie the Pooh. The Hampshire Downs of the TV series have little or no association with the real Hampshire Downs, and the opening of each episode in the first two seasons presents a rough map of locations in the story that bears absolutely no relation to the landscape Richard Adams knew and loved so well. The only geographical distortion in the 1978 film, for which it stood trial in episode 72, was Captain Holly's incredible journey from Sandalford to Watership Down via Ephrafa. However, here, all pretense to be presenting an actual landscape is abandoned in the interest of original storytelling. In a series such as this one, I suppose that is inevitable, but it is still a source of regret to me that tugs at my originalist side. However, and let's not forget this, exactly none of my issues with this series whatsoever mattered to the children for whom it was their first introduction to the world of Watership Down, and many of them went on to discover what had come before while still retaining a love for this series. Put simply, it can be very sweet and also tell some very good stories, which I am going to enjoy going through over most of the coming year. Next time, we begin our episode-by-episode -episode analysis of the TV series.